All right, but then let's get started. It's 10 o'clock, we have plenty of material to go through. So the title is ClickOps over GitOps. Scary, huh? All right, so I'm gonna talk about ClickOps. Uh, what I mean by that, I'm gonna talk about platform engineering, uh, which is a large trend going uh, on right now in the DevOps space. And I'm gonna uh, show you use cases with demos uh, with the ClickOps idea. All right, uh, just, just go and sit down, it's, it's okay. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Laszlo Pogas. I am a founder of a little bootstrapped company called Kimlet.io. Uh, prior to that, I was an independent DevOps consultant. Uh, I was working in the Nordics space. And the story was there usually that, uh, hey, we are in data center next to Copenhagen. Uh, let's go to the cloud. Let's do Docker. And hey, what is Kubernetes? So that's what I was doing. And of course, that's pretty much your role as well, I think, uh, in your companies. You go out, find, find all those op open source tools, and you try to put together to, to be like a, um, you know, like comprehensible for developers to use. And uh, prior to that, I was part of a Danish startup story, and I like to start things up. Wherever I go, I start up uh, meetup groups, Copenhagen, Cloud Native Copenhagen. And uh, right now, I'm uh, based in Hungary, so I'm uh, the, the founder of Cloud Native Saget. All right, so ClickOps, the scary term. So if you go on Google and search about ClickOps, it's, you know, it's the scary thing that you go on the AWS console, you click around, and then and that, that, that's it, basically. And that's, that's not a good practice, because obviously like, there's going to be inconsistencies if you are two or three uh, people just clicking around. Suddenly, you're just going to miss something, and then you, there's going to be your outage. And of course, that means configuration drift, and it's not manageable. But you all know that. So what do I mean? on ClickOps then. So it's kind of, I'm like reinterpreting the term and trying to uh, com come up with this, uh, this practice. I try to make dashboards uh, cool again, basically. So uh, ClickOps is doing cloud operations by clicking on, on a dashboard, you got that so far, uh, that generates a stream of infrastructure as code changes based on your actions. So suddenly, if you think of ClickOps uh, like this, uh, this is not as scary anymore uh, because Dashboards are not bad. Like uh, they have very good features. Like uh, uh, they make you, you know, be productive. Uh, common tasks you're gonna be able to perform faster. You're gonna be able to um, discover new features more easily. So even I, I am a seasoned DevOps engineer, but when I, you know, I need to launch a Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes engine. I always go to the dashboard first because they introduce new features all the time. And if I go to the CLI, like exploring all those switches, I, it's just, you know, the spatial uh, way of like discovering like toggles and stuff, you know, what's important and what's not. So dashboards have good features. But, you know, the, 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 the bad things about those is that if you click on the dashboard, suddenly, you know, it's just not productive and inconsistency is going to show up in a few months time. Uh, but with this approach, uh, because if you click and there is going to be like a Terraform diff or like a Terraform patch or, or like a GitOps file put into your GitOps repositories, suddenly you, you get rid of the configuration drift. And if you use a tool that uh, also allows people to actually access the underlying infrastructure as code uh, base and, and it could coexist uh, with people who use the dashboard and people who, who want to do the, the advanced stuff, stuff like uh, write those Terraform scripts or CRDs or whatnot because they know how to. And if these two worlds could live together, I like that vision very much. And that's what I, I try to uh, make a reality with my company as well. So why ClickOps? Uh, you know, I know it's shameful to click on the dashboard, but you know what's worse? Like sp spending three weeks achieving the same thing that you could have done like in two hours on the dashboard. So that's just the fact with infrastructure as code. Sometimes it's tedious, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's just not even possible what you want to do, and you bang your head into the wall. Uh, but then there is the other take, like, uh, you know, you could, uh, not write uh, infrastructure as code for three weeks, but then you're gonna spend maybe three months or more, like uh, many times my job was to, hey, we need to do this Terraform thing now because we are large enough and then I have to go through all these little things that people, not even with the company anymore, and then I have to put into Terraform. And it's really painful. So there is reason we are, why, why we are doing infrastructure as code. It's just, it's sometimes tedious. Uh, so is ClickUp's a new thing? In this interpretation, I would uh, say so. It was only just a year ago when uh, I uh, saw this tweet from Corey Quinn. He's a hilarious person on Twitter, like so funny. He's just making fun of AWS and all the hyperscalers whenever they are doing something 
bad billing or expensive or some shenanigans, so he calls those things out. Uh, this one time he was serious actually, this was just a meme, like, uh, yeah, first to the console, yeah, I will not explain memes here. <laughs> but, uh, so this time he was serious and uh, he put down this vision which, I, which resonated with me, with me very much that I can still use the console, it would generate me this stream of changes in infrastructure as code, and then this, this line that suddenly using the console stops being a shameful thing. Like, uh, we are a little bit elitists, uh, all of us here, and we are engineers, we want code and tests, and whoever uses the dashboard is just not an engineer, whatever. So is, is it a new thing? Yes, I think in this interpretation, uh, my company Gimlet IO surely uh, talks about this. Uh, I've seen Ambassador Labs uh, cloud offering as, as well using ClickOps, I think in a similar sense. Uh, and there is something going on right now in the, in the industry that's called platform engineering. And there are many hundreds of teams building platforms. Hands up if you are building a platform for your developer team, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and in some way or another, you try to achieve a very similar thing. You try to make uh, the many open source tools digestible for developers, like uh, easing the co cognitive load. So maybe uh, having a UI is your goal, maybe not, uh, but you are certainly simplifying uh, the open source space. And uh, those internal efforts may or may not lead into a UI, uh, but you know, having a polished UI is a hell of a lot of work. So platform engineering, I'm just gonna click quickly go through that, uh, because I think you are familiar with the term. Is there anyone who have not heard it? All right, or just shy? Uh, cool, so it's the golden path, the paved path, or the internal dev platform over you know, the uh, cloud native landscape, uh, because there are great tools out there. They can give you great capabilities, but when you try to plug them together and you try to make just one nice user experience to your uh, custom needs, uh, or, or to, to your team, it's just, some, it's just painful and it's a lot of work. So uh, um, I love Kelsey. It's like, it was f more than five years ago that he, that he wrote that everybody wants a pass. It just has to be built by them. So that's why platform engineering is, is going on right now. And then there is, this was like mm, almost four years ago. And he was so right on, on the money so early on. So I, I just love this guy, how clever he can be. Um, yes. So why are we doing this? There are many tools and we are shifting all things left. You know this term like there's software uh, writing, coding, then there's QA and security and I don't know, um, compliance and all that. And you try to shove everything to the left, like poor developers now have to know everything. And honestly, like DevOps is uh, early take, like you wrote it, you run it. It's kind of a tall order if you don't have the right tooling. Like I can be, mindful of security if I have the right tools and there is like SNCC and other tools which you know gives, gives me you know like every morning I get those pull requests and I'm so happy about those but without this tooling it's just uh, it's an impossible work for engineers to be on top of everything plus DevOps mindset as skill is just seriously not evenly distributed some are very good at it some want to be good at it and some just couldn't care less they, they want to be in, into UX and other things and that's I guess it's all right uh, but you just have to be aware of this re reality that the, the, the DevOps uh, ethos is just, uh, you know, you, you need some tooling to, to get there, like uh, to have a good baseline in your team. Uh, I love this slide. This is not my slide. This is from uh, Daniel Bryan from KubeCon last year. Uh, this shows like how technology evolved over time from 2000, uh, 2020. And you know, first you had just a monolithic application, and then SOA, and you know, microservices, and then you suddenly you see the the cognitive load of, of developers, like how many things they have to keep in mind to deliver their software uh, to production. And this uh, red curve was basically the complexity or or the the load on developers, like they have to understand so many tools. And you know, it started out nicely. You know, I have one uh, monolith. I uh, upload the jar file, and I'm good to go. And then, you know, it became a bit more complicated, and ESBs and whatnot. And there was this uh, very nice moment in at 2010. I'm not sure if you can guess what those uh, tools were that made this nice moment here. That that's the Heroku moment. And uh, also like New Relic and other things, like you had those two nodes, you paid shitload to New Relic, but you had observability, you didn't need like a Prometheus cluster and 
and all that. And then, you know, things went out of control, like microservices and, uh, and all, the, all the great capabilities, because we got, a lot, we got many good things, which just uh, takes time and effort to put them together. And if you don't help with tooling, developers just kind of tell you, like, oh, just go home, man, I don't care. So I think uh, platform engineering is a nat natural progression of DevOps. Or it's still part of DevOps, so it's not like kill DevOps or anything like that. Uh, but you have to build those tools to, to help developers to, to, you know, just to manage this complexity. Uh, yes, it's a new thing. This is just a Google Trends report I, I made, so it's on, only like a year old trend, I think. Uh, in 2021's uh, Puppet report, self-service platforms was a differentiator. Like uh, uh, teams who had self-service, uh, they uh, had better uh, metrics on, I don't know, like uh, mean time to recovery and all those uh, cool DevOps metrics. Uh, also, Gartner recognized this as a trend, and we are on the hype cycle right now. Like, this is platform engineering with like a two, two to five year uh, long, uh, mm, I don't know, like a time frame until it's gonna reach a, a plateau of the productivity. So, yeah, we have a conference, and you know, uh, it's, it's happening, and uh, you know we are all platform engineers now, or <laughs> not, not DevOps anymore, or something like that. So if you not not SRE, so if you go home and you tell your boss that I'm a platform engineer, you might get a raise. So that's your ROI of this conference. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, and I, you know, so ClickOps uh, leads into platform engineering and goes back and forth, and I'd like to show you some use cases with demos, like. Uh, how we achieved some of those uh, those things uh, in Gimlet. So first of all, uh, you know, when a developer needs to deploy, he needs to write those Kubernetes uh, manifests one way or, an or another. Maybe you have your company Helm chart. Maybe uh, uh, you know you just write a row uh, Kubernetes uh, manifests. And uh, basically, and then you have the GitOps flow to deploy everything. I think GitOps is now the, the de facto standard to deliver YAML onto our cluster. Uh, and uh, with ClickOps, it was actually a very easy thing for us to do because uh, the file format existed, the Kubernetes resources existed, so it's basically just a templating question, like, uh, yeah, I need a deployment with this name and yada yada. Templating, then obviously it's a Helm chart, so, so we made a, a generic purpose, uh, general purpose Helm chart for um, web services and uh, cron jobs. So basically it exposes the 20, 30, 40 most uh, uh, common use cases, uh, and you, you basically just edit a values file and you get the, the larger uh, Kubernetes manifest. And uh, we also made an open source React component on top of it, because uh, there is, it, it's a little less known fact that Helm charts can have schemas, and if you have a schema, you can generate a UI on top of it. So we made uh, a React component that actually we use and open source and everything. On this blog post you can, you can read the rest. Uh, basically, you take a Helm chart, you throw this uh, component on top of it, and then you can basically render uh, uh, the Helm chart and you, you, can make, you can configure it on the UI. I want to show you this, uh, just the open source part, if you are cool with that, just one minute. All right, uh, so I need to cheat. So I have this little command, manifest configure, and with a YAML file, like what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm editing. It uh, brings up a UI, and it's basically just a, a values file with a little bit of a, of a, sch a schema on top of it, plus uh, just some UI helpers, like how to render stuff, which widgets to use. So if I change it to five replicas, and if you if I add an uh, environment variable called uh, dummy2, and then value2, and if I just close this, this is just a little proof, proof of concept here, then uh, it actually wrote uh, this dummy ML. Uh, you can see the values here, replica5, wars, hello, and, and value2, and if you want to get uh, the uh, uh, the, the Kubernetes manifest out of it, you can render this and you will see that it generated a config map uh, with the two values and then deployment service and ingress and all that. Um, yes. It's, it's basically like Helm template uh, uh, 
comment. So Helm has some very nice uh, uh, things, and of course, people sometimes bash Helm for certain reasons, but if you, if you use it for the right uh, thing, I think this, it, it is still a great tool. So this was just a short demo on, on this uh, first use case, like how to put a UI on top of uh, Helm charts. It's simple, basically, uh, because everything was out there. You just I just needed to write this uh, React component. Use case two, DNS. So that is also, you know, in the old world, DNS was this heavy thing, like you needed to request through Jira uh, tickets and other teams and stuff, took days to, to make and they often messed up, so you had to start the process over. It's, it is also reduced to just manifest authoring, so like there is the Kubernetes resource ingress, it is great, uh, and with some more tooling, uh, it's actually, again, this problem is just editing a YAML file. But you all know that. Uh, but if you're not, you know, you make the, the Kubernetes ingress resource, there is a, a, an ingress controller behind it, and then the actual DNS entries could be done. Either you use like a Vodcard DNS and you are done with the problem, you just have a shortcut there, or you use an open source uh, tool called uh, external DNS, which uh, whenever there's a new ingress uh, showing up in your cluster with a new DNS name, it will uh, make the change in Cloudflare or some other DNS provider. It's very handy, it works super swift. I, I'm gonna have a workshop this afternoon and if you join and you're gonna make an ingress, it's gonna go into the uh, Cloudflare DNS in infrastructure uh, using this uh, little controller. Oh yes, and there is Cert Manager, another uh, project of this uh, ecosystem which is just magic and it works and Let's Encrypt is behind it. So all your domains will have SSL certificates which is like, oh my God, like still magic even after five years of using it. All right, secret handling uh, could be also reduced to just manifest ordering, uh, like manifest editing. I just have to use the Kubernetes. It doesn't uh, do secret management very well, or actually it doesn't really solve it. It has the resource, but it leaves many questions open. There's huge businesses built on top of it, uh, so that's the million or, or billion dollar question. But uh, to, for us to make it click ops, so like editing and, uh, and making it, it, it a manifest, uh, we use an approach called sealed secrets. It's uh, basically uh, you encrypt your secret and you can put it into Git and only your cluster can decrypt it. So it is a safe way to, actually it does uh, one very cool thing is that suddenly your application and your secrets are delivered with the same mechanism. Uh, if you don't use uh, this approach, this encrypted uh, Git ops based secret handling, then you know you deploy your application with your Git ops workflow, and s somehow s some other workflow is going to in inject your secrets into the cluster. And those things are a little bit, uh, I think it's, it's like a broken workflow, uh, and uh, Git ops pulls this nicely together. So I like that. And with this approach, it's again a YAML, it's again a, a custom resource in Kubernetes. We can template it, we can basically click on a dashboard and suddenly you can uh, have everything uh, backed with a, with a git uh, commit. So yes, it is click obst. Uh, the fourth use case, we need a database. Now things get more serious. This is uh, not my uh, play, this is Viktor Farsik's play, but it's basically, uh, you can even have uh, an RDS or a SIBO database uh, provisioned with Kubernetes custom resources today, which is super cool because, again, this was very uh, ticket-based. You had to ask your friend or friend or colleague uh, who had access to the Terraform, or you had to pick up the Terraform knowledge. And yes, I'm going to provision that uh, that RDS instance. But today, uh, a bit uh, cross-plane and uh, Flux also has like a Terraform controller component. Suddenly, everything is again. Uh, fits to the GitOps paradigm, which is amazing. If it fits to the paradigm, if there's a CRD, we can put a UI on top very easily. So you're gonna click on the dashboard, hey, I want a database. It's gonna create that CRD file, put it into the Git repository, and the controller is going to provision it. And again, uh, you are clicking on a dashboard, but you are actually you know, like uh, generating the stream of infrastructure as code changes that your colleague would do who uh, who doesn't use a dashboard. So the, the two worlds uh, play well together here. Uh, actually, back in the ingress, I wanted to show you something. I think, oh, I have only five minutes. So yeah, I'm gonna do it. So this is actually uh, Gimlet. So this is uh, uh, your, Git ops, uh, your Git repositories. These are the applications you developed and stuff. And this is my favorite one called Demo App. 
Uh, you can <laughs> see why it is my favorite. Uh, down here, you can see your uh, Git commits and so on. Uh, up here, there is a, a, an environment with different releases, and it is running now on the demo app 5gimlet.io uh, domain. So if I use the same uh, Helm component, uh, uh, React component as uh, before, and I go into the ingress part, and if I change the URL to demo app 6, suddenly, you can see a little diff here that's going to go into the Git repository. Uh, it's going to open a pull request for you, so it's not like you are like committing directly to, to main. You can still review like your uh, usual uh, code review process. And if you merge it, CI is going to build and all that. And once the build is done, uh, we can deploy this with Gimlet. All right, let's go back to here. You can see that uh, CI is running. Uh, there is just gonna be one uh, hiccup with this demo. I have to hit refresh on this page because one of the webhooks is not configured. That's just that's just how it is. Uh, when CI is done, uh, I'm gonna do the refresh and I'm gonna do the deploy. So uh, just one more minute. All right, image is pushed, everything is fine. I'm gonna hit the refresh I was talking about. And if I, as you can see, this is the uh, git commit that was deployed on the meta environment. And I'm going to deploy uh, this new version onto this environment. Uh, if I do this, there's going to be a GitOps commit made and then Flux is going to synchronize it to the cluster as you can see, Flux is now trailing, so it's you know just waiting uh, to to synchronize. And then you're gonna see that this demo app five is gonna change to six. I'm gonna click it, and by that time, Cert Manager did the work, external uh, DNS did the work, so it's all automated and just based on clicks. Oh, it's already demo app six. You probably seen it flashing and stuff. So if I click this one, it is HTTPS demo app six uh, and there is a stream of Git changes. So if I look at this one, one minute ago I released this version. It's actually uh, made the change in the ingress. So this is the ingress and the host was changed. So if people would not go to the dashboard, just go to the source code, everything is there. Uh, so that's basically how the two worlds come together. So I have three minutes left, so just uh, Yes, uh, there is another use case with uh, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, component marketplace. Uh, there are many great community Helm charts here. Uh, we put it on a, on a UI, and because of Flux's Helm release CRD, again, a CRD, everything is reduced to just editing YAML files. We can put a uh, UI on top of it. And honestly, like all marketplaces are good for you when you start up, but it doesn't allow you to manage that configuration and or how to update later on. So it's like a little bit of half-baked like most uh, marketplaces are. And then here's the, the most important thing. It's if you are clicking the dashboard, don't break the work of people who are not using the dashboard. The two worlds must coexist. And to do that, the, the UI should be robust, being able to handle like outside, ch outside changes. And don't, you don't have to, like, seriously, like, don't lose edits made, made outside of ClickOps because then suddenly, like, expert users are going to say that, yeah, that that is a crap software. And what we do is basically, since we are doing just uh, text file edits, uh, we can just do the same as Git. We do a three way merge. So basically, this was the baseline, this was the UI person, this was the uh, advanced person, and suddenly you can merge things together, and if there is a conflict, there are conflicts, obviously, when you edit stuff, then you can resolve those, and they, they're gonna, going to surface uh, nicely. All right, so I have one minute left. Uh, it's open source, so if you go there, give us a star, that would help us with VCs and all that, and so thank you very much. Uh, we have a SaaS early access, uh, because we, even though we have an installer, an open source installer, uh, we do a SaaS version just to make it more e easy to, to get started because it lands so much nicely into this idea that you click, 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 and off you go. Uh, we are on the Cibo Marketplace, this is me, and I'm going to have a, a workshop at four o'clock if you want to do just pure open source GitOps with me. So uh, thank you very much.